The scripture reading that we heard this morning is all about burning bush moments and standing on holy ground. Right now, uh, this online gathered community of God's people with, with God present in our midst is virtual holy ground. So take off your shoes that, that insulate you from, from being present in the moment. Open your hearts and listen to God speak to you this morning. Let us pray. Loving God, as we continue to revisit the early stories of Israel, grant us wisdom and ability to go deeper than just the surface account. Speak to your people in this time in new ways that we might understand. Amen. This week at St. John Stevensville, we received our order of plexiglass that's going to be installed before we can reopen uh, the doors for our in-person worship in October. Now, some of you might be imagining that we're putting everybody in plastic boxes, but think more in terms of, of uh, plexiglass as sneeze guards between you and your neighbors, kind of like the ones they would have at the Mandarin. And let me tell you, plexiglass is a hot item these days, much like toilet paper was back in March at the beginning of the quarantine. And while many folks were in quarantine, we saw a whole lot of home improvement projects uh, uh, for those who, who could access lumber or, or other pieces those projects that you always wanted to get around to, but you never really had the time, and now you had the time. I know uh, one of my sons was off work for a while, and, and he took up yoga and, and started making his own yogurt. In my own household, we, we had a, a quarantine crib tournament, which I just wanted to mention because I won with 43 games. But the other thing that happened while everything was shut down, was that we suddenly had a forced Sabbath. That forced Sabbath time when we were able to contemplate life and what was really important to us as individuals and, and as families and as communities. The Greek philosopher Socrates taught that a person could not discuss truth or beauty without first asking themselves the question, what is truth and what is beauty? Which is a way of saying that as we grow, we are encouraged to sometimes stop and take stock of, of our lives and sometimes to, to question our basic life assumptions. And quarantine has given us time for those kind of questionings. A good example of this was, would be the, the way we have been asked to stop and think about the concept of white privilege in, in the light of Black Lives Matter movement. Or on, on a completely different way, uh, another example would be, what are the basic skills or, or subjects that, that children need to learn when we're suddenly forced to homeschool them? It's a time when we thought, what is really important to us when we are compelled to discern those, those priorities in our lives? You know, through the grace of God, our creator, and the salvation of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have been given the opportunity for life abundant. And our lives should be lived as a reflection of that grace that we have received. And yet, we ask, why are so many of us willing to go through life just going through the motions of life? We don't often enough take time to, to stop and examine truth or beauty. We don't acknowledge uh, a 
a bush on fire or notice that we are standing on holy ground. We don't often take, take the time to examine what grace means or, or to be in communion with the God who loves us. From a classical Western philosophy uh, point of view, the act of simply going through the motions is not living. As Christians, we confess that God is love. So we need to intentionally reflect on how it is that we understand God and how it is that we understand love, even while knowing that, that God and perhaps even love is, is a concept too, too broad, too, too big for us to fully grasp. And yet we should be able to, or at least willing to, identify where, where we see God in our lives and also where we see love practiced. Sometimes these, these little moments of clarity, moments of grace, they are our burning bush moments. And our scripture reading today continues the story of Moses, the, the original boy who lived. After being nursed and weaned by his mother Jochebed, he goes off to live in, in the palace of, of Pharaoh with his adopted mother, the, the, the daughter of Pharaoh. And he is a very privileged young man. But there is this point in the story where he begins to see the reality beyond the palace gates. There is a point where, where he sees for himself the cruelty and, and begins to, to understand the repression and the injustice that is being inflicted upon the Hebrew people. And once he has seen this, he can't look away and he gets angry and, and we read that that anger explodes in this moment of violence where he kills a slave master and, and then he hides the body. But eventually, he's found out and he ends up being on, on the run from his grandfather, the Pharaoh. So Moses flees to the land of Midian, where he meets and marries a woman named Zipporah. And through that marriage, he comes under the protection of his father-in-law, Jethro, and, and Jethro's tribe. And there he finds peace. It seemed to be a very good life. He, he works for his father-in-law, tending, tending flocks out in the field. Uh, he and Zipporah have a son named Gershom, and, and all seems well. Except that, that contentment in Midian is a temporary transition time for Moses, because God still has plans for Moses' life. He was saved in order to eventually liberate the Hebrew people from slavery. It was him who would, who would bring his kinfolk out of the land and into a new land. And when the time was right, God called him back into service. We often talk about calls in the church, and, and uh, I remember my own call to ministry, and it was tested by, at that time, with the presbytery and the conference level, uh, before the, the laying on of hands at my ordination, and for me, that was a long process. It was a long process in many ways be, because it started when I was really young. And it took a lot of, lot of years for, for the discernment to, to seep in through before I really understand the, the to what I was being called. But I can attest to the fact that when God calls you to something, no thank you is not a response option. Now, for poor Moses, it was pretty hard for him to say no thank you to God when God is calling your name through a burning bush. And, and God is serious, and he says, take off your shoes. This is a holy ground kind of conversation. Now, exe exegetically speaking, we would say that this passage is, is a theophany followed by an epiphany. And that is to say that there is this divine, divine presence followed by a recognition or, of, of God's presence. God speaks to you, and you have no doubt that it is God speaking. And when God speaks in our lives, it is a 
holy moment. It is a sacred moment, and we need to pay attention. We encounter sacred moments more often than we actually acknowledge. And sometimes we're, we're too stubborn to even, to, or too senseless, to take off our shoes, so to speak. Life is full of moments when we find ourselves standing on holy ground. And over the years, I, I have prayed at the bedside of, of many folks who are on the, the last steps of their journey. I have, I have held newborn babies. I have been at, at gatherings where where the voices just come together in singing and, and it's so joyful. And I have been in gatherings where, where the silence is just heavy as, as everybody together mourns. And though those are moments of standing on holy ground. I have walked by the ocean and experienced a profound peace. I have, I have seen uh, thunderstorms with lightning in the sky that just took my breath away. I have heard a piece of music that moved me to tears, and while I don't always take off my shoes, I am always reminded that there are holy moments, and that I remind myself that it is a privilege and a responsibility for us to stand on holy ground. That day in the desert, when God spoke through the burning bush to Moses, God said, my people are suffering. And it was a statement of fact. Moses already knew that, that the children of Israel were suffering. The part of the holy conversation that disturbs Moses uh, is that God decided that Moses needed to participate in the liberation process. God is moving Moses out of his uh, complacency, whether he likes it or not. Because you see, once God speaks, you can no longer pretend not to know that God's people are suffering. And Moses was not crazy about the idea of him being the one chosen to lead. So his answer to God in that, in that holy moment, standing on holy ground was, who am I? Who am I to, to go up against the Pharaoh? Who am I to lead your people? This is a monumental task because, God, I know what my limitations are. And yet, despite all those uh, uh, objections and no matter what, what Moses' limitations were, ultimately, he was the one whom God had chosen for this particular task or we might call it ministry. It was for him to speak out and lead the people. And it's true that Moses had limitations, yet God promised to be with him all the way, and because we know the story, God was. Friends, when we reach those burning bush moments, when we experience those moments of, of grace and clarity, when we know we have been called by God to act in some way, when we have the faith to discern where the questions of our heart are leading us, we realize that we are standing on holy ground. And from that grounding, we can be assured that God has promised to be with us all the way. And for that faith, we say thanks be to God. Amen.